We'll start the hearing, and I do apologize uh, for the delay. Uh, today, the subcommittee is meeting to review four bills relating to breast cancer. H.R. 995, the, ma the Mammogram and MRI Availability Act of 2009, sponsored by uh, Congressman Nadler of New York. H.R. 1691, the Breast Cancer Patient Protection Act of 2009, sponsored by Ms. DeLauro of Connecticut. H.R. 1740, the Breast Cancer Education and Awareness Requires Learning Young Act of 2009 by Congressman Wasserman Schultz from Florida. And H.R. 2279, the Eliminating Disparities in Breast Cancer Treatment Act of 2009, sponsored by our, our own member, Congresswoman Castor, from, also from Florida. And I want to thank all the sponsors of these bills for the hard work on raising awareness about these very important issues. And I should also point out that they've been spending some time over the last six months trying to have this uh, subcommittee have this hearing. And the reason for the delay was, of course, we were dealing with health care reform. Now, aside from the non-melanoma skin cancer, breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in women. The NIH estimates that over 190,000 new cases of breast cancer will be diagnosed in women in 2009. And though we have seen breast cancer death rates decline since 90, still approximately 40,000 women will succumb to the disease this year. And that's why the work of advocacy groups and the key sponsors of the bills today is so crucially important. We have made great strides in detecting and treating breast cancer, but there is still much more to be done and much more to learn. While all of these bills address concerns related to breast cancer, they all focus on different aspects of the disease from screening and early detection to treatment and quality improvement. And they all raise very important issues with respect to how breast cancer patients or any other patients for that matter are being treated in the medical environment we live in today. Not every American has access to good preventive services. Not every American has the good fortune to have an insurance plan that covers the medical care they need. And that's why we are working hard trying to pass health reform legislation that will improve access to quality and affordable health care for every American. If enacted, health care reform legislation will dramatically improve our efforts in the battle against breast cancer. Particularly important are the insurance reforms. In drafting America's Affordable Health Choices Act, we took the same tack as Ms. DeLauro did in taking decision-making authority out of the hands of health insurers and putting it back in the hands of patients and their doctors where it belongs. In addition, the subsidies offered in the exchange and expansion of the Medicaid program under health care reform will cover uh, childless adults and mean that many low- and middle-income women who might not have access to health insurance today will be covered in the future uh, for the first time. And that means they will be able to access a doctor and receive treatment when they need it. A key component to winning the battle against breast cancer is effective and appropriate screening, which both Ms. Wasserman Schultz and Mr. Nadler's bills seek to address. Early detection of breast cancer has long been acknowledged as an effective way to improve outcomes. In fact, studies have shown that the five-year survival rate in women who have received timely treatment due to early detection is at 98 percent. And that's why the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has recommended that all women over the age of 40 have a mammography screening every one or two years. Now, I agree with my colleagues that early detection and prevention is key, key to survival. And that's why in health reform we bolster the very important work that the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force does by providing increased funding so that they can analyze more studies and make more prevention recommendations. The evidence-based recommendations that receive the highest ratings from the task force, such as mammography screenings, will be covered by all insurance carriers participating in the health insurance exchange and by Medicaid. And while Medicare already covers these services under health reform, beneficiaries would no longer face cost-sharing requirements to receive them. In addition, in health reform, we must also improve the quality of care that is provided in this country, um, as Ms. Castor is seeking to do with her bill. Tens of thousands of Americans die due to preventable medical errors every year. Billions of dollars are wasted on low-quality care. We as a nation must do better. Improving quality is a concept we picked up in health reform as well. We require the Secretary to establish national priorities for quality improvement, and we also create a Center for Quality Improvement. The Center will develop and encourage the use of best practices for quality assurance and will provide implementation grants to those who are already doing innovative work to improve the quality of care. Using breast cancer as an example, we can and must do better to ensure that all Americans receive the highest quality care 
and that we collect data that will help us continuously improve as more information becomes known about the medical system and specific diseases. Now, I want to thank all of our witnesses. I know we're going to start after our opening statements with the members panel. Um, I guess it's, you know, I, I would say it's, I guess, clear from my opening statement that in many cases some of the things in these bills hopefully will be addressed in the larger health care reform bill, but I don't mean to suggest that that takes away from the need for us to have this hearing today uh, or, pos or, or to move forward with these bills. It may very well be that some things are included and some are not. Um, and so uh, this is a legislative hearing uh, and the intention would be uh, to move these bills, but we also have to see what's included in the health care reform as well. So thank you, and with that I would yield to our uh, ranking member, Mr. Deal. Thank you, Chairman Pallone. Thank you for holding the hearing, and thanks to our colleagues for appearing before us today and for the other distinguished witnesses whose testimony we will certainly look forward to hearing. All of us, I think, understand the importance, <laughs> as does somebody else understand the importance of the topics that's before us today. Um, many of us have co-sponsored many of the legislative agenda items that are before the committee. I, for one, have co-sponsored H.R. 1740 because I think it's important for early diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer, as well as the continued effort to, get, to educate young women about this particular disease. Now, we have dealt with a variety of issues over the years and uh, most recently highlighted by testimony from Ranking Member Barton about a constituent who, uh, in the midst of dealing with breast cancer, uh, had her policy canceled. The House has dealt with that when we passed H.R. 758 by an overwhelming vote of 421 to 2. So we have begun the process, I think, of dealing with many of the issues surrounding the treatment and diagnosis of breast cancer. But as we continue to deal with how we can best combat this disease, I believe that as stewards of the taxpayers' dollars, that we must make sure that these dollars are being used in the most appropriate way, particularly those that are within NIH and CDC. We must assure that these limited resources are appropriately uh, expended to fight all diseases, including breast cancer. And I have particular concerns about some of the expenditures in both NIH and CDC that would appear to be uh, far beyond the normal pale of what people regard as important research for those two agencies to be supervising. So I look forward to the testimony and I welcome our colleagues uh, on the first panel. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Deal. Let me mention everybody, that's just a recess. We're not voting, just so you know. I recognize the gentlewoman from Colorado, Ms. Deget. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, out of respect for our intrepid and courageous witnesses in our first panel, um, I will uh, waive my opening statement and submit my very excellent statement that everyone will be able to read in the record. Thank you. Thank you. Next is the um, gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Blunt. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a statement. I'll submit it for the record as well. I'm pleased we're having this hearing. Uh, I'm pleased to be a co-sponsor of H.R. 1740, the Early Act, with uh, my good friend, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, and uh, look forward to the hearing. Thank you. Gentlewoman from California, Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief, but I want to salute our colleagues, but especially our colleague, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, for her courage her passion, and her example. Uh, many of us wore pink today in solidarity with her. We're strong supporters of her bill. Uh, hopefully we will find a way now that it is uh, in an acceptable form to committee staff to include it in the health care bill with the robust public option that we are going to pass uh, on the House floor one of these days. Uh, just briefly, uh, I have a brother who's an oncologist. I couldn't have been prouder uh, when he was uh, given the Healer of the, War, of, of the Year Award by Marin County, California uh, for his work on breast cancer. Breast cancer attacks oldies, grandmas like me, but it also attacks beautiful young women like Debbie Washerman Schultz and hopefully not uh, my daughters who are a bit younger than she is uh, and hopefully not my granddaughter who's a lot younger than she is. So. Uh, this is something we all have experience with. All of us know people who have breast cancer 
Hopefully they all will be survivors, and most of us uh, are very responsive to the Susan G. Komen and other efforts uh, to raise awareness. Uh, I just want to say that these bills are all good. Uh, I am rousingly enthusiastic about Debbie Wasserman Schultz's bill, and in that uh, context, I would like to ask unanimous consent to insert in the record a statement by the United, United Jewish Communities in support of that bill. Without objection, so ordered. I, I guess I didn't get the memo to wear the pink. I see Jerry did. But I was given a pink bat in lieu of the gavel today. Well, so maybe we'll use that. Well, Jer Jerry uh, Nadler uh, represents uh, two of my kids on the west side of New York, uh, one of whom is female. So uh, it's a good thing that he has high awareness of this. I just want to uh, add a couple of facts. One, advances in cancer research and treatments have greatly improved survival rates in the 1960s, a woman diagnosed with breast cancer had only a 63 percent chance of living longer than five years. Now it's 89 percent. Uh, Hispanic and African American women have a lower survival rate than the rest of the population. So clearly we have a lot of work to do uh, on reducing racial disparities. Uh, and finally, uh, ne next Friday, October 16, is National Mam Mammography Day. Uh, it's a day when radiologists provide free or discounted screening mammograms. And hopefully the women in my district and all those who can hear us at this hearing uh, will uh, take advantage of this. Breast cancer is a terrible opponent, but it's a beatable one. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Next um, is a gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Gingrey. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I did have an opening statement I'd like to give. Deaths from breast cancer among women have dropped more than 2 percent each year since 1990, due in large part to the intervention of improved treatments and early detection of the disease. A study published in 2008 found that the United States has the highest rate of survival for breast and prostate cancers in the world. These statistics are just a small example of the quality that makes our health care system a leader throughout the world. Unfortunately, being the best is not the entire story. While our health care system is a benefit to many with breast cancer, the disease is still the second most common cancer that women are forced to deal with in the United States. It's estimated that 192,000 new cases of invasive breast cancer are expected to be diagnosed this year, and roughly 40,000 women are expected to die from the disease in 2009, 40,000. These are sobering statistics that beg our thoughtful consideration. Therefore, I would like to commend the efforts of our panelists and all those who strive each and every year to bring attention and awareness to a disease that has impacted many of our friends and colleagues, some of whom are sitting here with us today, as we well know. Uh, I applaud their efforts to raise the awareness and early detection of breast cancer among our nation's patients, and I look forward to hearing their testimony today. However, we must also take a step back and look at the legislation before us in the context of the overall reform plan re reported from this committee uh, at the end of July. From what I surmise, two of the bills before us today address federal requirements on insurance plans that would, in essence, I think, become moot because of H.R. 3200. If H.R. 3200 were to become law, this Congress would not be deciding what benefits insurance companies must contain or what measures should be used to ensure non-citizens cannot use taxpayer dollars to purchase health insurance. Those would be the purview of a political appointee with little regard for the will of the people. After the outpouring of concern and constructive criticism for the President's plan during the August recess, I had hoped to come back to these hollowed walls and find a new Congress open and willing to work in a bipartisan fashion for the benefit of our constituents. Today as we sit here with the specter of H.R. 3200 hanging over our heads, it is looking more and more that that hope to be a false one. Mr. Chairman, it seems the lessons of August have not been learned by some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Uh, I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Gingrey. Next um, is our chairman, Mr. Dingle. Mr. Chairman, I thank you. Good morning. I would first like to thank you for holding this hearing. It is an important one, and it's an opportunity to learn more about the four breast cancer bills before us today. 
Breast cancer is the second most common type of cancer amongst women in the United States. So it's important for us to continue a vigorous examination of how to best prevent and treat this disease. In 2009, an estimated 192,370 uh, 192, new cases of invasive breast cancer will be diagnosed among women. And approximately 40,107 of these women are expected to die from the disease. An additional 1,920 cases of breast cancer are expected to occur amongst men. In my home state of Michigan alone, there will be an, ex an estimated uh, 6,480 new cases this year and 1,350 deaths. It is estimated that about 8.1 billion is spent in this nation every year for the treatment of breast cancer. While real strides are being made against the disease, the five-year survival rate is 98% when de detected early. But too many women continue to lose the battle against breast cancer for want of proper treatment and proper early diagnosis. H.R. 995 would require a group, of health, a group health plan that provides diagnostic mammography for women over 40 to also cover an annual screening mammography and an MRI for high-risk women. The National Cancer Institute has recommended that women 40 and over should have a mammogram once every one or two years. Doctors and patients should make the decision whether to have a mammogram based on risk factors, not the cost. Another bill under consideration is H.R. 1691, the Breast Cancer Patient Protection Action, of which I am a sponsor. H.R. 1691 would ensure that women undergoing mastectomies would be guaranteed 48 hours of hospital care unless the provider and the patient determine a shorter stay is appropriate. This is again aimed at dealing with the problem of, of drive-through mastectomies and other things of that character is provided by the health insurance providers of this country. The legislation would also protect physicians who provide quality care for breast cancer patients from retaliation by health maintenance organizations and other insurance companies seeking to maximize profits at the expense of patient care. This bill is of great importance to me because a member of my staff in Michigan was a victim of these unscrupulous insurance companies' practices when she was sent home after a mastectomy in considerable pain with no support to manage her condition. She ultimately succumbed to her cancer, but the heartless way in which her insurance company treated her was an outrage. Guaranteeing the treatment decisions are made by the provider in consultation with the patient. Taking into account the patient's unique medical needs is the cornerstone of good, successful, and believe it or not, inexpensive or the least expensive medical care. H.R. 1740 would direct the CDC to develop and implement a national education campaign about the threat that breast cancer poses to young women of all ethnic and cultural backgrounds and the particular heightened risks of certain groups of our women. It is important that we examine the ways to educate our young women and medical professionals about breast cancer in young women. The final bill considered today, H.R. 2279, would address the disparities in breast cancer diagnosis and treatment by requiring providers to report their practices to encourage doctors to offer adequate care to all, irrespective of race, income, age, or health insurance status. Together, these bills will protect women from drive-through mastectomies as well as advance breast cancer prevention and treatment amongst high-risk communities, young populations, and minorities. This hearing coincides with, with National Breast Cancer Month and will shine light on issues of great importance to women and the, their families. I look forward to the testimony of today's witnesses, and I commend you for the hearing, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Dingell. Next is um, one of the sponsors of the bills. Oh, I'm sorry. Next is uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess. 
one of the co-sponsors of the bill. Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, and I know we've got votes, I will submit my statement for the record. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. Uh, next is uh, one of our prime sponsors of the legislation, a gentlewoman from uh, Florida, Ms. Castor. Chairman Pallone, thank you very much for convening this timely hearing on breast cancer legislation during National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Breast cancer is still a brutal killer in America, uh, but we're going to continue to fight and we are going to make progress. And we're going to make progress due in large part to the leaders who are here today, uh, to my colleagues here on the Health Subcommittee, but to these uh, brave uh, members of Congress that represent uh, hundreds of thousands of people and many, many women who have struggled with breast cancer. Uh, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro, Congressman Jerry Nadler, and my good friend from Florida, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Uh, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz has been a fine example of perseverance and a great role model for anyone uh, that has, has been diagnosed with breast cancer, and I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of her bill. I'm also eager to hear from the top, top experts in the field today on our latest legislation. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, our colleague, Congresswoman Do Dr. Donna Christensen, is my partner on my bill, H.R. 2279, the Eliminating Disparities in Breast Cancer Treatment Act. Uh, that we will consider today. I would like to thank her for all of her attention to disparate diagnosis and treatment that still plagues health care in America. It is no secret that quality health care in the United States is not equally accessible to all of our communities. Uh, as a committee, we have worked diligently for the better part of this year to improve health care in America and to make quality care affordable and accessible for all. And we are closer to that than ever before, but we still have these underlying issues of disparate diagnosis and treatment that must be addressed directly. And one of the most disturbing involves breast cancer and women of color. Overall, breast cancer survival rates in the last two decades have improved, with one exception, minority women. Women of color suffer from significantly higher death rates after diagnoses than white women. The American Cancer Society reports that delays in receiving care after breast cancer diagnosis are greater for African American women than for white women. African American women with breast cancer are less likely to receive standard therapy than white women. African American and Hispanic patients are significantly more likely than white patients to be diagnosed at a more advanced stage of breast cancer. And regardless of insurance status, African American women are almost two times more likely to be diagnosed with an advanced stage of breast cancer than white women, and Hispanic women are about one and a half times more likely to be diagnosed with an advanced stage of breast cancer than white women. African American women are 10% more likely not to receive tests to determine if breast cancer has spread to axillary underarm lymph nodes. This screening is essential to preventing the spread of cancer to other parts of the body. Health insurance status, race, income, and educational background are directly linked to irregularity in administering this vital screening. Substantial disparities remain regarding cancer diagnosis and treatment. So in order to eliminate these un this unacceptable variance in treatment and quality care, it is necessary that we create real incentives and requirements for medical professionals to provide the best care. All patients re should receive the most modern and high standard treatment for their conditions. So our bill seeks to put an end to the inequities in treatment for breast cancer and help, will help ensure that every patient has access to the most appropriate care. The legislation will implement breast cancer treatment performance measures requiring the Secretary of HHS to work with the National Quality Forum to develop standard bre best practices for breast cancer treatment. These measures will address patient outcomes, the process for delivering medical care related to breast cancer treatment, patient counseling and engagement and decision making, overall patient experience, physician care coordination, 
and then the Secretary will develop a six-year breast cancer treatment quality performance initiative. In years one through three, physicians will be encouraged to follow the new recommendations and report their practices on a voluntary basis. In years three through six, the reporting will be required at reporting will be required and the Secretary will evaluate the care that is furnished to patients. Low quality treatment from providers will, will result in reduced Medicare payments for those physicians. Improvements in treatment will be recognized and payments will be scaled based on the care provided. Uh, the Secretary will be required to report to Congress so we can tr keep track of the progress. Mr. Chairman, this legislation will help eliminate disparities in the treatment of breast cancer. We must continue to use all of our expertise and modern tools to fight this brutal killer, improve diagnoses, and improve treatment. It will save lives, it will save money, and it will save heartache in heartache. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to hearing from the panels. Thank you. A uh, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome my colleagues here. They are all sincere and respected public policy uh, experts, and I appreciate their attendance, and I yield back my time. Thank you. Gentlewoman, uh, gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll put my full statement in the, in the record, but I do want to thank all of my colleagues, Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Rosa DeLauro and Jerry Nadler and Kathy Castor for the wonderful bills that I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of. I, I just do want to tell you that Chicago has one of the largest disparities in death rates as a result of breast cancer. A report le released in 2007 showed that breast cancer kills minority women at a rate of 68 percent higher than, um, than, than white women, mostly because of uh, inequities in access to quality and affordable care. And I want to give a shout out to an organization. We're actually going to have a briefing with them next week. Pin a Sister is a Chicago-based organization started by Access Community Health Network, uh, Community Health Center. Every Mother's Day, the organization coordinates an event in black and Latino churches. The women in the congregation are invited to place a pin on a sister to empower her to learn more about breast cancer and to show she's not alone in her experience with, uh, with breast cancer. But they need help. These bills that um, you have, uh, have sponsored and that I feel certain that will pass really going to help them and all, um, all women, those facing breast cancer and potentially those uh, who may face it in the future. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. Gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank our colleagues for the good work that they have done and the attention that they have brought uh, to this issue, and we're delighted uh, that you are here. I will uh, place my full statement in the record. I do want to highlight some of our volunteers in Tennessee that have done exceptional work on the issue of breast cancer. Our Tennessee Breast Cancer Coalition really has taken the lead in Tennessee. We do know that the work we did last year on the Breast Cancer Environmental Research Center Act was um, very important. This is something the environmental pressures that come to bear on Tennessee women is something that has it has gained a lot of attention in our state and has caused a lot of concern. And we have several facilities that are doing a great deal of wonderful research. Uh, the UT Cancer Institute, the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center, and the Mini Pearl Sarah Cannon Cancer Center. And so I highlight the good work that is being done there. In Tennessee, we have 3,970 new cases of breast cancer that will be diagnosed this year and 910 women will probably end up losing their life to this disease. We know the legislation before us will help assist the good ongoing research equally in the manner that the legislation we passed last year did, and we look forward to eradicating the disease and certainly making a difference in the lives of men and women that are affected by this. And I thank you for the hearing and yield my time. Thank you. Gentleman from Utah, Mr. Matheson. 
Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'll submit my full written statement for the record, but just very briefly, I, I would point out that um, it's appropriate we have four different bills today. This is a complicated issue, and there are a lot of aspects in terms of addressing, uh, trying to fight this disease that uh, we should consider as a committee. And I want to thank the uh, lead sponsors, Representative Castor and Representative Nadler, Representative DeLauro and Representative Wasserman Schultz for, for championing this issue. Um, Congresswoman DeLauro has been such a great advocate, and I was the original co-sponsor. I remember we passed this in the House last time, and hopefully we get it across the finish line this time. Uh, um, you know, a lot of people point out different populations that are affected differently, and I would just highlight one interesting demographic in my home state, where in Utah the, the incident of breast cancer is actually much lower than the national average, and yet the mortality rate is about the same. And that's because we have a problem where it's usually diagnosed at later stages. That's why Congressman Wasserman Schultz's bill is something of particular interest to me that will help in my state. And it just points out that you hear these opening statements from people around the country with different constituencies and whatnot, and there's so many ways we need to try to attack this issue. Um, I commend the committee for holding this hearing and bringing all these folks together. I look forward to advocating for all these bills. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, want to once again thank my colleagues for being here, and I'll yield back my time. Thank you. The um, gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you and, and Ranking Member for holding this hearing on such an important issue and making, we hope, this Breast Cancer Awareness Month a decisive one in the fight against breast cancer. I'd like to welcome my colleagues as well. With these bills, we not only ex expand access to mammography and other often life-saving breast cancer screening technologies, but would protect and ensure the health care coverage for breast cancer patients, educate women earlier about breast cancer, and eliminate the breast cancer disparities that have a disastrous impact on far too many women of color. I'd like to thank Representatives Natalie DeLauro Castor, with whom I worked on 2279, and especially uh, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Uh, herself a breast cancer survivor, especially for your bill's emphasis on educating younger women earlier about breast cancer. It's unacceptable that today one in every eight women will, women will have invasive breast cancer at some point in her life and that breast cancer remains the second leading cause of cancer death for women in this country. But as grim as these statistics are, they're even worse when you consider racial and ethnic disparities in breast cancer incidence, mortality, and prevention. Uh, for example, while African Americans have lower breast cancer incidence rates than their white counterparts, they're more likely to die from the disease. Latina, American Indian, and Asian American women are not only disproportionately more likely than their white counterparts to not have a mammogram in the recent two years, but finally, while breast cancer death rates have been on the decline since 1990 overall, we find that the five-year breast cancer survival rate for American Indian women is lower than any other uh, population group of women. So these statistics suggest that while we've made great progress in the fight against breast cancer, much to the credit of the witnesses we'll hear from today and continuing with the legislation before us, we have a long way to go, and I look forward to today's testimonies and discussions and anticipate that this hearing will serve as an impetus needed to take our collective fight against breast cancer and every cancer, really, to the very next level, and I thank you. Yield back. Thank you. Gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. These are all incredibly important measures, and I just want to salute our colleague and my colleague Kathy Castor for their, their work on this. Um, I'm embarrassed, Debbie, that I'm not wearing any pink today, <laughs> but I'm turning pink with embarrassment at that, so that'll have to do. Anyway, congratulations on your work. We look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barrow. I, I'm, I'll mention to members that we have three votes, a 15 and a oh, four, I'm sorry, four votes. There's a 15 and then three fives. Um, well, let, let Mr. Barrow, if you'd like to make an opening, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I would. Uh, it's estimated that one in eight women will develop breast cancer over their lifetime, and it's the leading cause of death among women age 45 and older. This disease is far too preventable and too treatable for these numbers to be so high. I know because my mother, who turns 89 years of age today, is a 35-year survivor of breast cancer. Curing breast cancer is a huge challenge, 
and it can only happen with good science, adequate funding, effective treatments, and greater awareness in education. These bills we're addressing here today represent small but important steps along the way. October is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. This gives us an excuse to come here today and work on this legislation, but I look forward to the day when this month will not be a time to raise awareness, but a time to celebrate how our collective efforts actually led to the eradication of breast cancer. I want to thank Chairman Pallone and Ranking Member Deal for addressing this important issue on our subcommittee, as well as Representatives Nadler, DeLauro, and especially my colleague, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz, and Congresswoman Castor, for introducing these critical bills that promote breast cancer prevention, research, treatment, and quality of care. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. I think that concludes our opening. Now, we could get a couple of you, and I don't think we can get all three. Do you want to proceed? Okay. All right. I, um, I'll, I'll dispense with my remarks other than to say the three of you are wonderful and two of you are cancer survivors. All three of you have been, you know, championed this and other issues so effectively. If anybody can get anything done, it's the three of you. And I start with uh, Congressman Nadler of New York. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Deal, and the members of the subcommittee. Thank you for convening this hearing and for inviting me to testify today about H.R. 995, the Mammogram and MRI Availability Act. Uh, I also want to thank the breast cancer advocacy groups for coming to testify about the work they do, the problems we face in the fight against breast cancer, and the ways in which they and their organizations are helping to educate, screen, treat, and care for women living with and at risk of developing breast cancer. We all know people near and dear to us who have battled breast cancer, my wife among them for the last three years. We all know the statistics. Breast cancer is the second leading cause of death of women in the United States, the leading cause of death of women aged 40 to 49. This year alone, more than 40,000 women in the U.S. will die from breast cancer, more than 192,000 ca new cases will be discovered. We also know that in addition to the need to find a cure, prevention is the difference between life and death. The 2005 National Institute of Cancer study affirmed that mammograms contributed to a pronounced drop in the number of breast cancer deaths. Study after study has found that yearly mammograms, annual mammograms done from age 40 on, help find tumors at their smallest and most treatable stage. That's why the American Cancer Society and others recommends that women age 40 and older should have yearly mammograms. And that's why I introduced H.R. 995, a bipartisan common sense bill to ensure coverage of annual mammograms for this population of women. While many insurance plans cover diagnostic mammograms, that is, mammograms used to diagnose whether an already known mass or tumor is cancerous, many insurance plans do not cover screening mammograms for the purpose of detecting tumors in the first place. Based on the research and on what we know about breast cancer, this is simply unacceptable, and women and their families deserve better. We would save many, many lives. If, plans covered, if all plans covered annual screening mammograms for women of age 40 and above. As we have learned, mammograms on their own do not detect every malignant tumor. For women at particularly high risk, risk of breast cancer, women who have a strong family history of breast cancer, where a woman's mother, grandmother, sister, or daughter was diagnosed with breast cancer, or those women with the BRAC1 or 2 genes who have a genetic predisposition to developing the disease, MRIs help detect more tumors at their earliest, most treatable stages that mammograms cannot detect. For this population of women who are particularly susceptible and at high risk of developing breast cancer, the American Cancer Society recommends an annual mammogram and an annual MRI. As with coverage for mammograms, insurance companies do not routinely cover screening MRIs, even for this high-risk population for women, of women. H.R. 995 would make these important screening exams available to the women who need them most. While women should consult, so in other words, what this bill would do is to say that any health insurance plan that provides for coverage for diagnostic mammograms must provide coverage for screening mammograms for women annually over 40 and for the high-risk population of women over 40 for MRIs annually as well. While women should consult a doctor before undergoing a mammography or MRI, nothing in this bill requires a woman to seek a doctor's referral prior to receiving one of these life-saving screening exams. Nor does the bill require a woman to undergo any test unless she chooses to do so. As the subcommittee well knows, Congress is on course to pass a historic health care reform bill this year. That legislation contains important prevention 
provisions that would eliminate copays and deductibles for recommended prevention services. These recommendations should include screening mammograms. However, neither House of Congress has passed the legislation. Furthermore, even if passed, delays upward of five years or more could continue to limit women's access to these exams. Therefore, passage of major health reform won't necessarily prevent these women from continuing to fall through the cracks. Additionally, the prevention measures likely to be included in the final health care reform package do not currently include coverage for MRIs for high-risk women. Thus, the women most at risk, the women with, with strong family histories of the presence of breast cancer, as well as those who are genetically predisposed to the disease, will continue to be left without access to these life-saving exams. Only passage of H.R. 995, either as a standalone bill or by inclusion of its provisions in, a, in the comprehensive bill that this committee is helping to, to shape now, will ensure that these women have the coverage they need and on which their lives may very well depend. Mr. Chairman, with the passage of this bill, or with its inclusion in the overall bill when that passes, women age 40 and older, as well as those women at particularly high risk of developing breast cancer, will no longer continue to fall through the cracks. With this legislation, these women will be guaranteed coverage for life-saving screening exams. As we wait to find a cure, ensuring coverage for screening mammograms for all women aged 40 or over, and where indicated for the high-risk population of women over 40, for MRIs as well, could make, mean tremendous benefits for many, many women and their families in the fight against breast cancer. Mr. Chairman, I thank you again for giving me an opportunity to discuss this bill, H.R. 995, the Mammogram and MRI Availability Act, and for holding this important hearing on women's health. I look forward to working with you as well as my colleagues on the subcommittee to pass this legislation in one or the other form. Thank you very much. I thank you. Congresswoman DeLauro. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Ranking Member Deal, uh, for hosting this uh, uh, effort today. I also want to say thank you to this uh, uh, subcommittee and to the full committee on a bipartisan basis that have supported the Breast Cancer Patient Protection Act, and I appreciate that, as the women around the country do. Uh, also, my colleagues, Jerry Nadler, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, uh, all of whom have uh, Kathy Castor, Donna Christensen, um, are coming, trying to come to grips with what is a singularly uh, a, a big health issue for women around the country. And I would just say to Debbie that uh, her courage and her, uh, and, and her tenacity in, in this effort is well known, and she clearly is a voice uh, for, uh, for young m women. To all of the advocates who are here today, thank you. We can't do this without you. Um, it's an honor to, uh, uh, to work with you, um, and uh, your, your efforts, again, also keep us um, strong and determined to uh, make sure we pass uh, uh, good legislation. It was 13 years ago that Dr. Kristen Zarfos, who was a Connecticut breast surgeon, she told me that HMOs were forcing her to discharge her patients before they were ready, just sometimes hours after a mastectomy. She testified before the subcommittee last year, insurance Insurers suddenly refused to pay for a reasonable hospital stay, regardless of any underlying or complex medical problems that patients might have, diabetes, heart disease. Uh, this is still happening. Patients continue to be discharged with no consideration for adverse reactions to anesthesia, post-operative pain, even, uh, or even when they're awake enough uh, to understand their discharge instructions. At the um, subcommittee hearing last year that was convened, we had a breast cancer patient, Alva Williams. She testified she had a mastectomy on March 6, 2006, was sent home several hours after surgery. The insurance company would not cover an overnight stay. Um, <coughs> the family didn't receive proper training on how to care for her. She developed an infection uh, in the incisions. And recovering from that infection caused Ms. Williams' chemotherapy treatments to be delayed six weeks. Um, Arizona, her, a woman's story on Lifetime a TV website. I had a double bilateral mastectomy in June of this year. I was discharged within two hours after surgery. I had severe complications that later resulted in being readmitted to the hospital within the first uh, week post uh, uh, post-surgery. Uh, the stories go on, and I will, my testimony has been submitted. You've got a woman in Kansas City whose husband was a physician, and she found that it was difficult even with a caregiver who was uh, a physician. So this is happening across the nation, which is why, uh, in my view, we need to pass the Breast Cancer Patient Protection Act. Um, it says that simply, very simply, 
adequate recovery time in the hospital should not be negotiable. The last thing that any woman should be doing at this time is fighting with her insurance company. The bill does not mandate, it does not mandate a 48-hour hospital stay. If a patient chooses to go home sooner, fine. Nor does it set 48 hours as a maximum amount of time a woman can stay in the hospital. It says that any decision in favor of shorter, longer hospital stay would be made by a patient and her doctor and not by an insurance company. So uh, I've, I've been in the hospital many months. And let me just tell you, it's not for everyone. It's not where you want to spend your time. Uh, but it's important to know that successful outpatient mastectomy programs have been extremely careful to empower their patients through education, monitoring outcomes, and working intensely to minimize complications. Th last year, 421 members of Congress voted to enact this legislation. Bipartisan support. We introduced it this year. My colleague, your colleague, Joe Barton, uh, Mr. Dingell has spoken out on it. Lifetime Television has a petition calling for the Breast Cancer Patient Protection Act's passage. Nearly 24 million people have signed on to this petition. Uh, we have 236 co-sponsors, Senator Snow, Senator Landrieu, 17 co-sponsors in the Senate. We're ready to do this. We need to move forward. We have a number of, sub uh, uh, of supportive uh, advocacy groups out there. I will just conclude by saying uh, to you that let's, let's do this. Let us do this for the women of this nation. What happened on the Senate side to us last year was the insurance companies. We passed it, 421 votes. That tells you something about the need. It tells you something about the support. Let's do it again in the House, and let's make sure that our Senate colleagues do the same thing. Thank you so much for letting me speak to you today. Thank you, and thank you for your passion, really. We only have about a minute left. I was going to suggest we come back, if that's OK. All right. We will reconvene after these votes with uh, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz. Committee is in recess. So this House hearing on a break now, this hearing on breast cancer to continue following votes on the floor of the House. The House now in a series of four votes and our live coverage continues when the hearing resumes shortly. Uh, other programming information for you at 3 Eastern today will be live as a Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Subcommittee gets an update on preparation.